Hi everybody. It seems like a long time since we've seen each other. Tonight I'm going to finish the second half of the lecture on physical assessment. I believe where we left off was with the chest and lungs. I'll start that section from the beginning and go through until the end. So when you assess the chest and lungs, you want to assess the respiratory rate, the respiratory rhythm, the respiratory depth. Also note the symmetry of the chest and the chest movement. You can refer to Table 21.3, page 401 for respiratory patterns and terminology. Palpate the ribs. Inspect the skin for any abnormalities, and check the fingertips for clubbing. If you look at figure 2117 on page 410, you can see a picture of clubbing fingers. Clubbing is an indication of chronic respiratory disease. Assessed for, assess for chest expansion. That another word for that is excursion. That's the term we usually use medically. Excursion should be equal on both sides of the lung or both sides of the chest. Decreased or absent excursion on one side could indicate pneumonia or atelectasis. Atelectasis means a collapsed lung. Of course, as you already know, you want to auscultate the breath sounds. That's skill 21-6. You use a stethoscope and you're listening for abnormalities, any adventitious sounds or abnormal sounds. So you're listening for wheezing, ronchi, crackles, strider, etc. Breath sounds can best be heard if the patient is sitting on the side of the bed or with the bed in the high Fowler's position. If the patient cannot sit up, place them in the lateral or side-lying position. The diaphragm of the stethoscope should be placed directly on the skin to auscultate breath sounds clearly. They should be at, auscultated anteriorly in the front of the body, laterally on the side of the body, and posteriorly. <clears throat> excuse me, and posteriorly on the back of the body. If you look at figure 2111 on page 403, there's a diagram. You want to listen for a complete respiration. So what you're listening for is the inspiration and then the expiration. Normally, you're going to hear air moving in and out of the lungs, and the breath sounds are equal when you compare the left to the right side of the same site. The five sites of the lungs you auscultate are the left upper lobe, the left lower lobe, the right upper lobe, the right middle lobe, and the right lower lobe. The right lung, as you know, has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. When listening to breath sounds, you follow an orderly sequence. Listen to the left lung, then go to the right lung, simultaneous or right across from where you are listening. You listen in the intercostal. Intercostal means the between ribs. So you listen in between the rib spaces and you move the stethoscope from side to side. Then move to the next lower intercostal space. Move the stethoscope from the higher lobes to the lower lobes. And if the breath sounds are equal and clear to auscultation, in other words, they sound the same when you listen, you write it as CTA, clear to auscultation. Next, let's talk about adventitious breath sounds. The first sound are crackles. Crackles used to be called rails. Now they're cra called crackles, which is probably a better description because they sound like crackles. Crackling sounds usually are heard on inspiration. They sound like the sounds made when wood burns 
or the crackling noise of salt being heated on a frying pan. The next one are ronchi. Ronchi is very easy to detect. It's a low-pitched, deep snoring, rattling, gurgling sound. That happens because there's an excess in the airway secretions and the airway becomes narrower. Ronchi are usually heard on expiration. Ronchi may clear when a person coughs. There, I cleared my ronchi, I sound better. A wheeze, I think you all know what a wheeze sounds like. Sometimes wheezing is able to be heard without a stethoscope. It's detectable just to the ear. It's a high-pitched, continuous, whistling, musical sound that you hear with inspiration and expiration. It's the classic sound of lungs in a person that is having an asthma attack. The next thing is stridor. Stridor is a high-pitched sound that's heard on inspiration. It's shrill, high-pitched, and harsh, like a crowing sound. Whenever you hear stridor, you're hearing a sound that is a medical emergency. It is a sign of an obstruction or blockage. It could be a foreign object, a foreign body in the lung, or a tumor. It can often be heard without the stethoscope. Another sound you hear is a pleural friction rub. The pleura is the membrane that encases or surrounds the lung. When you hear a friction rub in the pleura, the, the layers of the pleura are rubbing together. It's a grating, creaking sound due to inflama inflammation causing the pleural surfaces to rub. In common terms, you've probably heard of this referred to as pleurisy. The last thing you might hear is what's called consolidation. The secretions in the exudate from pneumonia solidify in the lungs. And what this means when it's consolidated is that you may not hear any sound in that lobe or the part of the lung that is affected by the pneumonia. No breath sounds are noted or documented as absent breath sounds. The next thing, of course, you want to measure the oxygen saturation. Find out if the person has a cough. Is the cough just a dry, non-productive cough? Or is the person coughing up sputum? If, that, if there is sputum, you want to obtain a sputum culture if it's been ordered and it has not already be done, been done. Always know the color and the odor of the sputum. The next section we're going to talk about is the cardiovascular system. You want to palpate the radial pulse, noting the rate, rhythm, and strength. The apical pulse, the same thing, note the rate, rhythm, and strength, and then listen for the apical radial deficit, which you know means one nurse takes the apical pulse while the other nurse takes the radial pulse at the same time with the same watch, and then they compare their results. You want to check the peripheral pulses for circulation or circulatory deficits. You want to auscultate the blood pressure. Listen to the heart sounds. The PMI is known as the point of maximum impulse. That is the apex of the left ventricle that's located just inferior to the left nipple. S1 is the sound heard as the left ventricle contracts. That's the lub sound. And S2 
is the diastolic sound as the left ventricle relaxes. That's the dub sound. So it's lub, dub, lub, dub. Next system is the abdomen or the GI system. You want to ask your patient to void before the exam so they'll be more comfortable and then position them in the dorsal recumbent position. So the dorsal recumbent, as you can see from my drawing, the person is laying flat with their knees flexed and elevated. Look at the abdomen, see if it's symmetrical in shape. Look at the abdomen to see if you see any distension or swelling. Why would a person's abdomen be swollen? Well, maybe they're pregnant. Maybe they have gas. Maybe they're retaining fluid. Maybe they have a full bladder. Or it could be a sign of a bowel obstruction. Always ask the person when they last voided and when their last bowel movement was. Note any visible pouch pulsations, except in a very thin person, a pulsating abdomen could be a sign that there's an aortic aneurysm. And then, as you know from lab, you want to auscultate the abdomen for bowel sounds. Bowel sounds are very important because it's evidence that peristalsis is taking place. Without peristalsis, you cannot properly take in food and digest it or eliminate it. So in order to eat, you have to have bowel sounds. Bowel sounds are gurgling, intermittent noises that sound like clicks and gurgles. They normally occur every 5 to 30 times per minute. So to check the bowel sounds, have the person lay supine and place the stethoscope over a, one of the four quadrants of the abdomen and divide the abdomen in, a, in four like a tic-tac-toe board with the umbilicus being the center. Begin listening in the right lower quadrant. Go to the right upper, the left upper, and then the left lower quadrant is last. Now, these are some things you might hear when you listen for bowel sounds. You might get hyperactive bowel sounds. Those are very frequent, continuous sounding bowel sounds. That's more than 30 clicks per minute that you're going to hear. Hypoactive bowel sounds. There's long periods of silence between the sounds. You might hear less than five clicks or gurgles per minute. There's absent bowel sounds. That means you're not going to hear anything, even after listening for two to five minutes. Then there's borborygmus. Borborygmus are bowel sounds that are loud enough to hear without a stethoscope. Usually, I know for myself, I've had that happen when I'm in an interview or in a quiet movie or somewhere where it's very embarrassing, but you can actually hear the sounds with the barrier. You want to palpate the abdomen and percuss it, but that is done, the percussion and the palpation is deep, so it is usually done by a skilled practitioner or someone who has a certification in this. You want to measure the abdominal girth. So you take a tape measure and place it around the largest diameter of the abdomen. You want to indicate where you put the marker with the, where you put the tape measure with a marker so that nurses that come behind you in the future will be sure to measure the abdomen at the same spot. If you do, if the abdomen is distended, it could indicate fluid in the abdomen. And this is often a sign of ascites, which is part of liver disorder. The next system is the musculoskeletal system. You want to observe for body alignment, posture, and symmetry. Look at the spinal curvature. 
check, check the person to see if there's any curvatures that are abnormal, like scoliosis or kyphosis. If possible, assess the person's gait. Note the base of support, their stride and balance, how safe you think they are, if they would be a fall risk. Look for signs and symptoms of immobility. How does the patient transfer from the bed to the chair? Do they walk independently? Do they need the help of a person? Do they need a two-person assist? Do they ambulate with the use of a device, like a cane or a walker? Or are they totally immobile and need a mechanical lift? Is the patient able to sit up on their own? Can they churn in bed or do they need assistance? Do they need partial assistance or total assistance? Does the person have any contractures? A contracture is a shortening of the muscles so that it becomes permanently flexed. We'll talk more about that with the dangers of immobility in a following lecture. But because your muscles that flex are stronger, when the muscles of the arms and legs aren't being used, they will go into a permanent state of flexion, and you will not be able to straighten them. Also, another thing that happens to the muscles with disuse is atrophy. Atrophy is the wasting of muscle from disuse. Any of you ever have a cast on your leg or arm and you've got it on for, say, six weeks? When they take the cast off, that arm or leg is going to look much thinner than the other arm. That's from just use and not using that muscle. And the same thing happens to a person on prolonged bed rest. You want to inspect and measure the limbs for symmetry. In other words, they should be equal in length and width. Look at the joints, inspect the joint movement. Your joints should move easily and quietly and pain-free. You may, if you hear a sound, a grating sound when the person moves their limbs, it's called crepitus. And it probably is an indication of a form of arthritis. You want to assess the CSM, which is the circulation, sensation, and motion of the limbs or the motor function. That's used a lot to assess wounded limbs or people post-operatively. So if I'd have had my, um, my knee operated on, you'd want to assess that limb to make sure my toes are warm and moving and that I can feel a touch in my toes. Perform range of motion on all the joints to determine if there are any limitations. And then you want, lastly want to test muscle strength. You perform range of motion against resistance. So you as a nurse press down on the joint while the patient performs range of motion pushing up and not letting you push their limb to the bed. Or have the patient grasp and squeeze your fingers. Instruct the patient to resist when you press a limb down or press against the hand or foot. The lower extremities. Look at the lower extremities and check for edema. Edema could be due to hypertension, fluid retention, inadequate pumping of the heart, or kidney disease. One thing we do to assess this is check weight. You're looking for a weight gain of three pounds daily. That would be a signal that something is wrong and the person is retaining fluid. Question any changes in shoe and ring tightness. So if your ring suddenly became too tight, you may be retaining fluid. Look for indentations from, your, from the socks when a person is retaining fluids. 
and you take the socks off, you can see a large indent on the ankle when you remove them. Also, look at the puffiness of the eyes and hands, the abdomen, or any bloating, which also indicates fluid retention. Pitting edema. Pitting edema, you can see on page 442, figure 2119. You want to take your thumb and press the patient's skin over a bony prominence, usually near the ankle, with your fingertip or thumb, and hold it for approximately two seconds, and then release. If pitting edema is present, an indentation of your fingertip will remain after the fingertip is removed. The depth of the depression or the indentation determines the extent of the pitting edema. Trace pitting edema, that's minimal indentation, noted when the pressure is applied. The skin tissue refills as soon as the pressure is removed, but it takes a little bit longer. Plus one pitting edema, there's a slight indentation, probably two millimeters. It only lasts 15 seconds or less once the finger is removed. Two plus, the indentation is double, four millimeters, and it lasts about 15 more seconds than plus one. Plus three, the same thing, it goes up by two. So the indentation depth will be six mm's, and it could last for one full minute. Plus four pitting edema, the indentation depth is eight millimeters, and it can last two minutes or longer. Then, which is not in your book, but there is a thing called brawny edema, where the edema in the, the leg becomes so much that you can't even pit it. At that point, there's nowhere for the fluid to go, and you'll actually see it to start to, to um, seep out of the skin. Pitting edema is a serious sign that the person is retaining fluid. The last thing I want to talk about in this section are your reflexes. The reflexes, you test those with that rubber percussion hammer. You know what I mean. The doctor taps on your knee and it involuntarily goes up. Reflexes are anything that your body or your muscles do that doesn't require conscious thought. You're not thinking about raising your leg when that hammer taps your leg. Normal DTRs, which are known as deep tendon reflexes, which is what we're measuring, the muscle's going to con contract automatically when it's tapped. That shows that you have normal deep tendon reflexes. You want to check the color capillary refill of the fingernails and toenails. The next system is the genital urinary system. You want to look and see if the person has an indwelling catheter. Look at the urine for its color, clarity, and how much there is. Palpate for bladder distension. Measure the intake. Intake is the amount of liquids the person drank or the amount of IV fluids infused. Anything liquid that goes into the body is intake. So it could be IVs, it could be a blood transfusion, it could be liquids that you drink. It would not be food. It has to be liquid. Measure the output. The output is your urine output, what's in the catheter bag. You want to inspect the external genitalia for color, any discharge, and normal hair distribution. Palpate for lumps, masses, or hernias. And then a pelvic exam or prostate exam. That would be performed by the MD or an advanced practice nurse. But you may be assisting, so be prepared to do that. 
The other thing you're going to assess and interpret are lab results and imaging results. You want to look at the lab results because this is an important part of the patient assessment. You're going to gather information about your patient when you look at their patient record and their lab and imaging reports. As you progress through your nursing education, you'll learn reference ranges by heart for some of the labs. You will note that lab reports from facility to facility vary slightly. So one lab report may say what's normal is a little higher than what the book says, for example. What you should do while you're in school is go by the norms that are in your textbook. Whatever the book says are norms for, say, the white blood count, the red blood count. Make sure you go by those. Those are the ones you should learn. You should also look in the record for reports of imaging tests, like MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, any of those tests. The outcomes or findings of these tests will be clearly written out at the bottom under the word impressions. Some of the terminology that's used by the MDs may not be familiar, but it's a good chance to look it up so that you can become familiar with it. And then ask your instructor if you don't understand. Some lab work is done right at the bedside, like the CBG. That's the capillary blood glucose. That's the test we do when we check somebody's fast blood when we check somebody's blood sugar with the glucometer. It's done with a finger stick and you put a test strip into the machine and the blood sugar results or the CBG as we properly call them will register on the screen. The results of the CBG often determine the amount of insulin that needs to be given. So for example, if the insulin, if the CBG is 100 to 150, no insulin. If it's 150 to 199, two units, etc. So now you've done this wonderful job. You did a great job. You did a perfect nursing assessment, but you need to document. Make sure to document in your patient record. When you do your daily assessment, your documentation will be in your nursing note or the patient flow sheet. You'll have another lecture on nursing notes, and you're not expected to know how to write one at this time. But in general, when you record your findings, do so in an organized, concise manner. Document on one system before you go on to the next system. You don't want to jump around and say, for example, the patient is alert and awake, indwelling catheter, plus one pitting edema, oriented times three, out of bed, urine clear. You don't want to do that. You want to put the things that you're talking about with the the indwelling catheter, that the urine is clear and odor free, that should be in one section, etc. The last thing I have in this lecture is the skills assessment review. And if you remember way back when, it seems forever ago, I know, that I passed out that assignment with the clinical assessment in the paragraph where I had the patient and uh, asked you to document it. So I'm going to put that also online for you to grab. People, some people didn't get it. I know I didn't have enough copies. But remember, every day when you go to clinical, you do a brief bedside assessment when you come and when you go. You're going to do it with every patient you care for. Before you meet your patient, gather some data from the patient record, the nurse's report, and your instructor. 
Remember for good body mechanics to always elevate the bed during the bedside assessment. Keep the side rails raised for safety, except on the side you are working on when the bed is in the high position. And lower the bed to the lowest position when the assessment is complete and put the side rails down unless you have an order. You're going to gather data before you see the patient. You'll know their name, their date of birth, any significant medical history. You'll know their chief complaint, why they're here. Any signs and symptoms the patient's been experiencing? What kind of diet are they on? Do they have an IV? You want to review the recent labs, review the baseline vital signs, know if there's any treatments, dressings, catheters, anything you're going to be doing, enemas. You're going to be able to look at the MAR, which is the Medication Administration Record. That way you can familiarize yourself with the meds the client's on. That will probably come a little later than fundamentals. You'll know how the patient transfers and whether or not they're ambulatory. And you'll also know if the patient uses a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, or if you need to bring help with you when you move a patient. So you're going to do a mental status. You're going to get the level of consciousness, the vital signs and oxygen, height and weight. You may actually be doing this, or you may obtain the information from the record. You want to make sure when you weigh a person that you know the baseline so you can see if they, there are any deviations like gaining or losing three pounds. In nursing homes, the weight is always obtained on shower day. And as you know, there's several different types of scales. You could be standing. You could be on a chair scale or a bed scale. You want to look at the IV. That's very important. Assess it from the point it's inserted to the top of the bottle. You want to check the solution. Make sure the right solution is hanging from what you've seen in the doctor's order. Check the rate of flow, the ROF. Make sure it is correct and matches the doctor's order. Check the tubing. Make sure that the tubing is patented and doesn't have any kinks. Make sure the person isn't laying on it, which cuts off the oxygen supply or the IV supply. And then check the IV for any redness, edema, leakage, or pain. Observe any tubes that are connected to the patient oxygen catheters, chest tubes, drains, suction equipment. Check from the site where the tubing is inserted to the site of origin, just like you did with the IV. And on the oxygen, also make sure after you've made sure it's patented and that the tubing is positioned correctly, check the leader flow. Make sure the leader flow matches what you saw. You're kind of like a detective when you first go into the room and introduce yourself. Kind of make your eyes um, look around. Get used to be looking for those clues, any tubing, any um, IV, any, any catheter, any oxygen, any signs over the bed maybe that say fluid restriction or NPO. You just do a quick, brief assessment with your eyes of the whole patient, the bed, and the unit. Ask the patient about pain, from pain being a pain from 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever experienced, and 1 being just a dull ache. You want to know where the pain is and what's the character of the pain. Is it a dull pain? Is it a sharp pain? Is it intermittent, only happening occasionally, maybe when you move, or is it constant pain? Look at the skin. A thorough skin assessment can be done during the bed bath. That's probably the best time to do a skin assessment. 
Shower day, on shower day in nursing homes, they always have the nurses aide look at the client when they do the shower and call the nurse in when you're finished so she can look at the skin too, especially if there's abnormalities. Check for the skin turgor and any edema. So remember the skin turgor is the tenting to see if they're dehydrated and you know edema and of course to check for any pitting. Assess the chest and lungs, assess the heart, assess the abdomen, assess the circulation, CSM, circulation, sensation, and motion. Assess all the pulses. Don't forget to check capillary refill time, which should be three seconds or less in a healthy adult. Assess muscle strength. Assess neuroscience, the bladder and bowel, and assess the CBG if ordered. In conclusion, during clinical, your physical assessment skills are going to sharpen, and you'll be doing it every time you give patient care and every time you write in your care plan. Like I said a few minutes ago, nurses are detectives looking for clues about their patients. Another thing that I didn't mention besides looking at all the tubing and equipment, make sure the bed is in the low position and the patient has their call light. Is the patient comfortable? Do you detect any odors? This is all going to get easier and easier and it'll become second nature at a time. Hopefully, you'll be getting to clinical soon and be able to use your physical assessment skills. So that concludes the second half of the lecture on physical assessment. I hope you're all well and safe. Remember to practice social distancing. Cover your cough with your crook of your arm. And remember, the single most important thing we do in nursing to stop the spread of infection is hand washing. Good night, everybody.